Hi, welcome back to our series on the secrets of the scrolls. It's all about prophecy revealed and revisited. Uh, a lot of what we look at, um, we've heard messages and teaching on before, but it's, it never hurts to repeat. And then if it's in the Word of God, oftentimes we find a gem. We find something that, uh, wow, I didn't know that that was there. And it pops up and it becomes truth, living truth in our life, like the rest of the Word of God. Today, the title of this, this lesson is called A Scroll for Starkey. Um, I teach this series right now at Starkey Road Baptist Church. And so there's a, there's a play on that based upon the church that I'm at. And you will see uh, what I mean in a minute. Uh, if you go to another church and this these lessons go around the world, this recording does, and it's viewed by people and churches, uh, one in India, a Bible study, another one in another country, they, uh, it slips my mind, but individuals. And so if you're not at Starkey, you're somewhere, and you'll see how the application fits in today. And so we call this the Starkey Scroll, and that was the Starkey Scroll, or a scroll for Starkey in Greek. Um, we, are, we are at the point in this study of the scrolls, the secrets of the scrolls, as to being in the book of Revelation from this point on. So from now until the end, which is about five more lessons, I um, want you to hang in there with us as we'll be doing some things in Revelation, and I'm going to make comment uh, very quickly right now. So here's our introduction and our review. I want to give you a very simple outline on the book of Revelation, but we'll not be using it. But if you're new to this book, don't let it, uh, don't let it create fear and anxiety. Uh, may there be excitement and anticipation of, wow, this is really great. I want to learn these things. I want to hear this. I need to hear this again. And so there is a very simple outline, and it's actually in the first couple verses of the first chapter. And it is this. Chapter 1 is about things past. So chapter 1 is talking about John on the Isle of Patmos. Then chapters 2 and 3 are about the seven churches. We are living in the age of the church or the age of grace. Um, and so two and three is all about the present right now. Then chapters four through 22, the rest of the entire book is about the future. It's yet to come. Nothing's happened in all of those chapters. So things past one, things present two and three, and things future four through 22. If you can remember that, that'll be the... That would be a, a first perspective that you have of Revelation that you can remember. Start there, and then all the chapters will start dropping in, and you'll see how that works. So the outline we are going to use is, is seven sevens. Seven churches, seals, trumpets, signs, plagues, dooms, and new things. And as I previously said, I will not... B, this is not teaching the entire book of Revelation. I will do that another time. And uh, I don't know when, but what I am teaching comes out of that study. But it is appropriate and leans towards the scrolls, even though the book of Revelation, the entire book, is, is a scroll or a book. And within it, there are some scrolls. In fact, there's a few. So we'll be looking at some of them, and we'll be ending the study with the last one. And um, this I will not be using much. But once again, I want to show you some a simple way to understand the book of Revelation. We are in the church age right now to the far left, and that's present. The seven-year tribulation is future, and that's in the middle. That is seven years of God's judgment upon earth. And so there are pictures of what's going on in heaven, 
lots of storyline and revelation on what's happening on earth, and yet there is also truth and storyline told of what's going in going on under it, we would call it hell or the lake of fire or Gehenna. It has it has different things coming from the bottomless pit is there. After the tribulation, there is what we call the millennial raid. It's a thousand years with Christ on the throne on earth. At the end of that time, uh, Satan is loosed for a season. People that have been born during that time need to receive the Lord as their king, but people have that free will and choice, and many don't do that. And so there is a final revolt that is put down, and then we are at eternal, eternity future, that we don't even count time anymore after that. And so the life expectancy of the earth right now is 1,007 years and a smidge. And uh, if you can think of it that way, that'll help. This is what I will be showing because we're spending a lot of time on seals, trumpets, bowls, and some things past that. And so I wanted this here, and I have some excellent graphics coming up in each of those lessons. But look to the far left, and you see the red arrow pointing down. It's about the church age. And that started on the day of Pentecost and is going until the Lord comes back again, which we call the rapture. And all that information is just tucked in right there in that picture in white with blue. And you see the people ascending. Um, then to the left, church age, the cross, all the green area there. So here is what I will be handing out to the class starting next week. And you are welcome to get this in a Word document. Um, I am going to give all, I'm going to use the seven sevens outline, and I'm going to put what's in each chapter. And then I'm also going to put some notes also. And so this is a good sample of what that, sh those, it's two, actually two pages long. And it's just no pictures, it's just typed out. And so like chapter one, here we have seven churches, one to three. And so what's in one to three? Chapter one is John on the Isle of Patmos receiving the vision from the Lord, the revelation. Chapter two has four of the seven churches and three has the other three. So two and three are the seven churches. At the end of three, but before four begins, the rapture takes place. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put those kind of things in. If we go to another book in the Bible that fits and has a story, as a truth, as a prophecy that is being fulfilled in Revelation, I will drop that in with that reference, reference where it belongs. So stick with me on those things. All right, let's read. And we're in chapter 1 and verse 1, and then I'm going to skip uh, after verse, verse, uh, verse 3 uh, to verse 11, and then we'll move beyond that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. All right, so there is a threefold blessing for those that do the following. God will bless these things, and these are the things that we need to do. Number one, we need to read the book of Revelation, not run from it, but to read it. And what that means is we read it personally, and we read it or hear it publicly like the pastor gets up and would preach, or a Sunday school teacher, and he would read passages of Scripture from Revelation. We need, to hear, we need to read it. But most of all, we need to read it personally. Number two, we need to hear it. And the word hear it means in the Greek, as it does in the Old Testament Hebrew, almost exclusively, it means not just hear, but we hear with the intent to obey. So we listen to the word of God 
and then we implement it. And number three is that we guard the things of this prophecy, and guard is, is continual action. It's continual doing. We, we have to be on guard continually. What does that mean? We have to defend it. We have to stand by the truth thereof. We have to know what's in the book and know what's coming. And because of that, we have the opportunity to share that. So it is written to the seven churches, and he's told to write to the seven churches. And here is verse 11. Write in a book that you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so before we leave the first chapter, we already know there are seven churches. And two and three have all of these. And they have, each one of them has a letter written to them that is specific. It addresses what the Lord sees and the good that he sees in them and that which they're doing for the kingdom of God. But it also details if it has, and most of them have it, their, their sins what, where they come up short, what they're not doing, what they're getting sucked into, false doctrines, different things like that. And so with my saying that, let's understand the church age. And here's our map again. The church age is that which is to the far left in the green. It says church age, of course. And we are living in that now. And that started from the day of Pentecost after Christ rose from the dead after being crucified and the Holy Spirit came. And we're living in that age right now. And um, most believe we're living at the end of that age. So here are the seven churches that are mentioned. And here they are today and their locations. And let me, I probably will surprise you by saying they're all in the country of Turkey right now. So they're, they're all there, they're all in that nation today. However, they don't exist. The cities do uh, in the most part, but not the biblical cities. They're in ruins. So here's three things I want to share with you. <clears throat> Number one, about the seven churches as you read them. And I encourage you to go read them on your own, although I'm going to read one of them. We're going to look at one of them today. And uh, that's the scroll for Starkey. First of all, each of the seven churches were real and literal churches. They really existed. There are ruins. Um, we have history outside of the Bible. We know the book of Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. And you can see over to the far right, Laodicea, um, we also know that Laodicea is mentioned, but a book by its its name does not exist. But um, most of these letters were what were called circular. They were written to the church, but to be read around. Coloss the Colossi, which the book of Colossians is just south of La Laodicea. And so the book of Ephesus also could be the book of Laodicea that they would share that, but especially the book of Colossus, uh, Colossians. So there's a lot of sharing that went on, but these were the churches that the Lord wrote to specifically. So they were literal churches. Number two, they represent a historical view. And I, what we put here among scholars today and before me, um, back hundred, hundreds of years, um, there's a historical view of the seven churches, meaning this, if we line them up in the order that they are in the Bible, it seems that what was right with them and what was wrong with them drop into those these time blocks. For instance, uh, Ephesus 33 to 100 is called the Apostolic Church. They had the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, they had they had the great men of God, the people that saw and lived with Jesus Christ. And they were the foundational people and they're converts. And so this was a church that these churches in this era were built brand new 
with new converts, new love of the Lord, and and wonderful things to go on. Even, but what, even after they started, I need to make comment that all of them had their problems. But the dominant thing, this was the apostolic church. And then you can see because of their faith, uh, the Roman Empire starting back in the apostolic era, none of these stopped at the date they are. They sort of overlapped. They dovetailed into each other. Uh, going into 100 AD, John died about then. And so the apostolic church was starting to fade out of that mode into the martyr church of the next generation being killed for their faith. You see what we're saying? And each one would dovetail until we're all the way down to the last church and the church that we live in today of Laodicea, and that's called the lukewarm church. I have some other words for it too. Number three, concerning the churches. Number one, they were literal. Number two, they sort of have a historical breakout. But most of all, and this would be truth, there's an application today. And so I want to go to the Laodicean church. That's the era that we live in today. It's the one that's called lukewarm. Some have called it apathetic. Um, uh, some other words have been used for it. Um, and this is where I get a scroll for Starkey because it's written to the church today, and the church I go to is a church of today. Now, I'm not saying when we get into here that everything right it speaks of, and it speaks heavily on wrong issues in the last days, that every church is guilty. It's like they're just like a cookie cutter church. They all look the same, they all do the same, and behave the same. That's not true. We have great churches that have, have walked with God and avoided some of this. And yet we have once great churches that have not and have fallen in some of these aspects. And so here's what I, I say to the class that I teach, and here's what I say to you. Take this, take this as an application to your life as a member of whatever church you are in. Apply it to you first as a member, as a child of God, as a Christian. Don't look at it from the pastor down. Look at it from you, you, and you in to the church. And you can make a difference. And um, there are, as I said, there are some wonderful churches. And I didn't, I'm not teaching this lesson because my church is guilty of all of this stuff. But I guarantee you that within the church are individuals that wrestle with, with this and all the, all of what we see as negative would be covered, but so it all, I would say, as positive would be too. So apply it to you. All right, here's some background. Laodicea means literally please the people. Do you see all of a sudden where it's lukewarm? It's the era where we got to make people happy, not preach the word of God and let it fall where it falls. But we just got to change our wordage, change our music, change things around just to just to get people and that's a problem to start with it is a picture of the church age to now it's about 90 miles from ephesus the city was founded by antiochus and was named after his wife laodice and it was a common name in the day it pres it had money it was a banking center it had a huge temple had theaters a medical school was there and it was famous for salve that was made there, solarium. Uh, and then also in closing, it was noted for its manufacture of rich garments and black glossy wool. Colossians, Colossi was the same way. Several mineral springs were nearby at Thermopolis, while in the opposite direction were the snow-capped mountains of Colossi. And so she's tucked in between these two, a, a, a warm spring, mineral spring spa, and uh, snow-capped mountains for winter retreats. 
And so here's the letter to Laodicea, or to our church today, yours, mine, whoever. Under the, ch under the angel, the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful, the, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. Hmm. So, let's talk real quick. Number one, look at all the names of Jesus in verse 14. Amen, faithful, he's a true witness, he's the beginning of the creation of God. He's also the beginning and the end, which of which there isn't any and for God. All right, so he goes on and here's the first thing he says, I know your works, I know what you're doing, and he's for the Lord. And he says, you're not, you, you're not cold, but you're not hot. And he goes on to say, so then because you're lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth. I'll vomit you out of my mouth. He's not happy with that. Now, have you caught something in here? And I don't have to go back when, because we have the words cold and hot right here. Do you remember the hot springs of Thermopolis? And do you remember the, the snow-capped mountains of Colossae? Cold. And so this church sat right in the middle of both of them. And it was definitely a picture of where physically, of what was real, the mountains and the springs, but spiritually it applied. And the Lord knew how to, to bring that home to their life and their heart. And so the first question I have to ask myself with you is, take your temperature. Where are you? In these last days, it's real easy to fit in, lukewarm, because then we don't call attention to ourselves. Because you say, we continue, I'm rich and I'm increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So the first thing, this was a wealthy group of people. These Christians probably had money. Um, it was a wealthy town. And so they come along and say, well, I'm rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. He said, I don't need anything. And in saying that, it's implying that they don't need the Lord, that I don't lack anything, so I don't need to pray for needs. I have no needs. I have them all. I've supplied them all. I've made them all. I work hard and I get them, so I don't need, I don't need the Lord. But yet the Lord says, but, and know not that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. You, you got more problems than you think. And the word know in the Greek means to perceive with the eye. He said, don't you open your eyes and look at what you really are. And so number two would be a question to ask is, are you, how dependent upon you are you on, on the Lord? Just because we have, we have a wonderful church, we have a wonderful home, a great job, great kids. I don't need anything. And so I've, why do I need to trust the Lord? Why do you need to walk with God? And the Lord says, open your eyes and look around. Where are you spiritually? I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment, that's righteousness, that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now I need to use extra slides for this and I'm only gonna do the gold tried with fire on this one and then we'll advance it and we'll do the rest. But there's a, good, there's a big question among scholars and myself, what exactly is this talking about? The first point is, is this talking about faith that shall stand in every trial? So gold tried in the fire here is understood. So it's the dross is burned off, etc. cetera. Uh, very possible. Or is it talking about, James talked about pure and undefiled religion. Um, or is it talking about uh, the grace or divine godly influence which produces it, uh, testing and trials in God's grace. 
I almost want to say it could be all three. It's, it's just our life is is all of these three things, definitely. So he said, you need to you need to be challenged again. You need to understand what it is to to be tested and tried. And you need to have that gold edge on you. So if we move on, he talks about uh, about white raiment. That's righteousness, the righteousness of God. Right, good works. Get right with God, he's saying. Shame, so he says, that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. It, God saw right through them. He said, you're bringing dishonor to the name of the Lord. And then the cure to this is this. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Do you remember their medical school? And do you remember what medicine that they produce? Eye salve. And they're to put spiritual eye salve so that they could open their eyes again to God and the things of God anew. That's their way out of it, is that their salvation has to become fresh and new again in their lives. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent, go back the other way. And that a very famous verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Notice he's talking about man, not church. And in verse 19, just to finish things off, the Lord's saying, hey, I love you. Because I do, I rebuke and I chasten you. And he said, therefore, repent. I love you, but repent. And the word knock in the Greek is continuous action. It means Jesus is knocking on the door right now. And as a Christian, as a church member, and church membership does not make me a Christian, I have to understand and I need to understand that the Lord is continually knocking. And it's not just talking salvation, it's talking about relationship of the Lord. This church seemed to be functioning real well without the Lord. And so is he knocking at the door of the church? Is he knocking at the door of the homes of the people? But he's knocking. And if they come in, that's what the fellowship will be new again and be renewed and become vital with, with, with him and with them and how they are. To him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Think about that as a reward. You think about it. And then there's, do you know what the last verse is before the rapture? There's no other scriptures written that's before the rapture. It's the last one. This is the last verse till the rapture takes place. Here it is. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And remember what hear meant? Just don't listen, but listen and hear with the intent to obey what God said. So how do we, how's the scroll for Starkey apply to us? We need to, we need to unroll it and we need to take a look at it. And we need to hear what the Spirit of God is speaking. Listen to the preacher when he preaches. Let the Spirit of God work in your heart, but you must listen with the intent of obeying God's Word as it's preached. Listen to the teaching of God's Word at your church and apply it to your life. Hear with the intent to obey. And when you read the Scripture, hear it with the intent to obey God's word. So, how, here's the rapture. We're on the doorsteps of it. How in the world do you live in the last days? That's a good question. Because most people say nobody's ever, there hasn't been a last days. We're, if Jesus comes in a year, we lived in the last days. We're the, we're the group 
we're the ones that are going to be raptured out of here. We're going to be the ones protected by God and gone. And uh, I'm anticipating that day. Have you ever heard of an Ellie? E-L-E. Well, it means extinct level event. And it was, I never knew what it was till I saw a movie that's about 20 years old, A Deep Impact. And it was all about a gigantic meteor that's going to hit the earth and destroy it, literally. And that would make the earth, people, the whole earth would die eventually because it was that big and be that that terrible but do you know what if you're i mentioned you know nobody's lived in one of these times of waiting for the earth to become what's living on the earth to become extinct and uh but do you know what someone has already someone has lived in an ellie situation And it was Noah and his family. So, how did Noah live in his last days? How did he live? That it would be the same thing that would apply to us. Jesus talked about him when his disciples asked about the last days. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood... People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Wow. So Noah did this. And I'll let you go back in chapter 6 of Genesis, and you can read 6, 7, and 8. And you can see these things and how he did. Also, look him up in the book of Hebrews under the Hall of Fame in 11. Noah walked with God. He just walked with God. He had time that he got away from the building, from the family, from the crowds that was jeering him, from worries, from wonder. And he walked with God. The Bible says he walked with God. Number two, he worked for God. And he worked at that with on that ark. He worked for a chunk of his lifetime. And we're called as God's people to work on God's projects. That'd be the church. That'd be our family. That'd be our business. But whatever the God has placed in our way, and especially our church, do not neglect it. There is work to be done. There's, there's souls to be won. Noah worked on a structure that God had given him. The structure we have is the church building, is our church. Work on it. Volunteer. Get busy. Do something with it and for it. Remember, Noah worked with his family in doing that. So bring the family along with you. Noah witnessed to the lost people. They la they came and laughed. He told them what was going to happen. They laughed some more. And every now and then they'd come out and laugh him to derision. But he continued to witness. And we may we may get people laugh at us. We've had it. But we need to share Christ in our culture. We need to be witnesses, telling people about the Lord. And number four, Noah worshipped the Lord when he was on the ark. Did before, but he and his family spent time and worshipped God. They had time of prayer. They had time of, of praising God and just connecting as a family, as an individual. They worshipped the Lord for his goodness. We have that opportunity to come and do it corporately as a church family, body, but we can do that during the week. We should never, those are the four things that will, will save our sanity in the last days if we do them. 
Jesus also said before he wrapped up answering his disciples' questions, he said, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you know not, the Son of Man comes. And just as Noah was ready, we need to be ready because we don't know when Christ is coming back again. So coming up next is a white horseman comes a riding. It's lesson nine. And it's all about everything you did not want to know about the Antichrist. And it's a pretty good accumulation of what the Bible says about the Antichrist, who he is, what he does, his names, his end. Where does he come from? And I trust you'll join us. May God bless you. Thank you for listening in. It's a joy to teach God's word. Father, thank you so much for the truth of Scripture. Thank you for the example of Noah. And Lord, I thank you for the example of John, who is faithful. And of course, we thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for our church and the opportunity we have in these last days to make a difference. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.